The body was taken to Lehigh Hospital in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. There, coroner Dr. Mahalakis would perform the autopsy as Trooper Madden observed. The doctor determined the cause of death to be strangulation. There were no gunshot or stab wounds. The body's core temperature revealed the young woman had been dead less than 12 hours when her body was discovered. It seemed she had died some time before she was dumped on the roadside, as the coroner at the scene had guessed. Other tests indicated she had had sex before she died. Whether she was raped or had consensual sex at the time was not known. However, based on the circumstances, we believed at the time that a rape may have occurred. Dr. Mahalakis carefully removed the rope from around the girl's neck. Piece of hair, this black hair. Under the knot was a single dark hair. It didn't belong to this blonde girl. But was it the killer's? The hair would be sent to the FBI forensics lab in Washington, D.C., along with the knots for analysis. The type of knots could be important. They might help the FBI develop a profile of the killer. But the best clue came from the girl's left hand. There appeared to be something written on the palm. She had some faint numbers written on the palm of her left hand. They had been written on uh, possibly uh, in ink, and they'd been on there for some time as they had faded, and they were barely legible. Uh, it was thought by both Bill and myself that uh, possibly this could be the lead we were looking for that could possibly lead us to her identity. Numbers, the writing letters. was indecipherable, though it looked like it might be numbers. That's pretty faint. Can you get that? Agent Kohig suggested experts at the FBI lab could make them clear enough to read. It was thought that perhaps we could have these enhanced by the FBI lab in Washington, D.C., so the skin was removed from her left hand and it was forwarded to the FBI lab. The girl's fingerprints would be run through a national database of missing persons. But the results would prove disheartening. Checks were made with her fingerprints through the APHIS system, which is a national system of checking fingerprints. Um, they came back negative. Checks were also made using descriptors of the body and uh, characteristics of the body and that also came back negative. So we had no record of a person missing that matched this person we discovered. Then x-rays were taken by a forensic dentist. They could be crucial in identifying the woman. If a tentative ID were made and these x-rays matched those taken when the woman was alive, they'd confirm her identity. But first, she'd need to be visually identified by someone who knew her in life, which would be difficult after a full autopsy. Closing facial incisions made for the dental x-rays and masking contusions would take hours of painstaking work. To restore her to the way she looked in life would require the artistry of a skilled mortician. Stephen Mondock was just the man for the job. When we received her body, she had been through quite an ordeal. You know, we had to put a little bit of makeup on her. Um, we had to get her hair done. We dressed her. Uh, we made her look as lifelike as possible at that point. Uh, we then proceeded to take photographs that were eventually placed in the newspaper. Those photographs depicted her as more lifelike than she had looked when first found. But Mondock gave her more than a face. He gave her a name. When the coroner brought her in, uh, he said, we have a Jane Doe for you. And I said, Carrie, I said, you know, I, I don't like calling people Jane Doe. I said, it seems so impersonal. He says, well, what are we going to call her? And I said, well, she was found in Spring Township, right? He said, yes. I said, why don't we call her Spring? And I said, well, she was found in the dawn of the morning, so why don't we call her Spring Dawn? Mondock's caring work gave investigators exactly what they needed. 
They showed photos of the girl to dozens of truckers at local truck stops, restaurants, and gas stations. Some offered the names of people the girl resembled. Her young face struck a chord of recognition in many who saw it. Notices in local papers and on flyers also generated leads. The outpouring uh, of calls to the state police at the time was plentiful, and we had to sift through every lead to try to determine if this person was a local person. But none of the leads would pan out. Then, in late April, about a month after the body was found, the FBI lab called Trooper Madden. Their analysis showed the writing on the girl's left palm was a phone number with a Florida area code. Madden found the number had been disconnected, and he began to wonder if the area code itself was wrong. But it didn't seem right. It didn't seem to fit this particular case. In looking at this person, there was no tan. Um, it seemed as if she came from a winterized area, somewhat similar to where we were. However, we did not know where. Madden's best guess was that she came from west or north of Pennsylvania, probably within a 12-hour drive from where the body was found. Madden also realized that there were two phone numbers written on the girl's hand, not just one. So he noted all the cities within the 12-hour radius that had both the exchanges she'd written down. Madden and Kohik would send the numbers, along with photos and descriptions of the young woman, to sheriffs and state police in those areas. Perhaps the information would trigger some leads. As they worked the case, the people of Bellefonte followed each new development, offering help and support. There was a, a genuine showing of, of affection for this person and concern. I, I guess you could say she was posthumously adopted by the, the community of Belfont. And, and even though we were very quickly able to ascertain that she was not a local resident, there was still a very uh, strong sense of uh, she is someone that we cared about. As spring bloomed for Belafonte, the girl remained in people's thoughts. Her story touched everyone, especially Madden and Kohe. These colleagues and longtime friends could not stop thinking about her tragic death and trying to solve the case even after hours. At the time I was assigned to this case, I had a 17-year-old daughter, and Detective Madden had two teenage daughters. So I think for the both of us, we took a very strong personal interest in the case. As a matter of fact, it pretty much took up all of our time during our working hours, and we would often find ourselves talking to each other at night on the phone at our residences. Never was community support so strong as when Stephen Mondock began to prepare the body for burial. I had florists call donating flowers. I had hairdressers calling to do her hair. I had people donating clothing. I had ministers willing to give their services, uh, the vault company, the casket companies. The um, cemetery where she was to be buried was actually at the bottom of a beautiful mountain where there's wildflowers growing. Uh, we had the, vo the monument company had uh, donated, was willing to donate a stone to bury her. Um, it was just amazing how much the town all came together in an effort to bury her. More than a month after the body was found, it was time for a burial. Not only did the town want to bring closure to the tragedy, the body could not be preserved much longer. Still, Madden needed just a little more time. The last thing that we wanted to do as a police agency was to lose the body. In other words, we did not want the body buried at that point in time without identification. Just when the body could be kept no longer, a break in the case finally came. A sheriff's office in Maine received Madden's information packet on the girl. Though he didn't hmm. recognize her face, he called one of the numbers written on the girl's hand. 
he had no idea who might answer the phone. Yes, hello. Uh, this is Sheriff he reached Anderson Mark Rosenberg, a guidance counselor uh, at a local we'll school, speak. promising given the girl's age. I'm Detective Stables. Thanks so much for meeting with me. Tonight. A detective visited Rosenberg and his wife at their home. I'd like to see if you can help me identify the woman in this When the detective showed the Rosenbergs a photo of the girl, they immediately recognized her. Can you look at that for me, please? And when they spoke her name, it was eerily familiar. Dawn. Dawn Marie Birnbaum. Steve Mondock's choice of the name Spring Dawn had been uncannily accurate. And I was shocked. I was amazed. It was just a strange, strange, strange coincidence. But it felt right. She was part of our community. Mark Rosenberg was one of the last people Dawn talked to before she died. Investigators hoped he could lead them closer to her killer. After a search that stretched from Florida to Maine, investigators had learned the identity of a teenage girl found dead near a rural Pennsylvania interstate. As they spoke to Mark Rosenberg, a guidance counselor at the school she had attended, he said she'd called him just days before she died from a payphone. He'd tried to help her, but it was already too late. The school she attended was mainly for at-risk teens like Dawn herself. She'd had problems with authority figures ever since her parents' divorce. In Indiana, where her mother lived, she'd been through a dozen foster homes and run away almost as many times. But at this boarding school, she'd finally found someone she could trust, her counselor, Mr. Rosenberg. As Mr. Rosenberg was uh, talking to Dawn, uh, the operator was interrupting, telling her to put more money in. Time was running out, and uh, Mr. Rosenberg told Dawn to uh, call him again so he would know she was safe. She said she would do that. He gave her his uh, home telephone number, which obviously she then wrote on the palm of her hand. She said she'd call back, but in fact, uh, she never did call again. <laughs> 